Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's session. Today is actually May 13th, and we have quite a few uh, things to cover. Basically, it's an ongoing story that we started last time when we were talking about light and the nature of light, and basically we came up with the understanding that light was a wave. Today, we're going to actually uh, depart from that idea and come up with a different explanation for light in that it's not actually a wave, but rather it's a particle, or it's made up of tiny particle called photons. And that's the only way to, to, to really interpret some of the observations that uh, were made. One of them, of course, is a photoelectric effect, something that is common to you guys. Sorry, guys, if you hear noise upstairs, it's coming from the people working on the roof. So I'm sorry about that, okay? So people are banging and doing things. Anyway. Uh, so basically, uh, the photoelectric effect, the only way to explain it was actually through this, uh, this uh, n n uh, uh, the, the fact that the light is made up of tiny particles. Before that, actually, Mr. Planck came up with, a, with an explanation for something also that was disastrous in terms of, uh, of, uh, of our understanding of phenomena. Uh, and that is, if you heat up an element, if you take a material, for example, a piece of iron, for example, spoon, and you heat it up, What's going to happen in here is going to you put add heat to it. So naturally its temperature starts to increase. And as the temperature increases, it starts to emit light, okay? It starts with the dark, uh, dark red, then it becomes red and it's redder and yellow and all kinds of uh, spectral uh, lines that's going to show up. The point being in here is, as long, of course, it doesn't melt. It don't, don't reach a point where the temperature is so high, then the uh, material melts. But the point being in here, that phenomenon was hard to explain. It was called actually the black body radiation, which was some sort of an idealization of this phenomenon. And trying to explain it with the, with, with, without this, this, this thing was hard. So basically without the idea that energy is actually quantized was hard. So uh, it led to something called the, uh, the, U, uh, the UV catastrophe in a sense that uh, for, for long wavelength, for red light or even longer, the observations matched the theory beautifully, but for shorter wavelengths, the, there was a major problem. So we couldn't explain that. So Mr. Planck threw in a constant in there, nature was called Planck's constant, to, uh, to uh, and uh, basically hypothesize that the energy levels of the electrons or the, or the, 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 the gas or whatever that is emitting those, those uh, uh, frequencies must be quantized. And in doing so, he explained beautifully the, the, the black body radiation and the emission and all of that. Obviously, he himself had issues with it. So he was kind of apologetic about the idea because it did not make sense to him or to anybody else in his time. Uh, Mr. Newton, Mr. I'm sorry, Einstein, when he learned about the, uh, I mean, when, of course, he knew about it, the photoelectric effect, he wanted to explain it. So he borrowed immediately the idea that Mr. Planck has introduced and introduced the concept of photons to explain the photoelectric effect. So what is the photoelectric effect? It's something that you probably have seen on the roofs of some people, or maybe on your own roof, where you have uh, photocells. So what is a photocell? It's made up of, 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 of let's say, for example, uh, it's a metal usually. And uh, light, as it hits the, uh, the metal, if it has the right frequency, not intensity, not too intense, not too bright, it's not the intensity that matters. If it has the right frequency, an electron actually will be emitted, and in which case now we have an electron that is floating. So the only way to explain this one is somehow that the, there is a momentum imparted from light to the electron so that the electron escapes, okay? And ma materials have this cutoff frequency below which the, no matter how bright the light is, no matter how much intense it is, it's not, you're not going to see that. So the only way to explain it is that somehow light is made up of tiny particles that have momenta hitting the electrons and giving them the, those momentum, this momenta, and at the end the uh, electrons leave the, uh, the, the material, the, ma the metal. So that was the first time when we were exposed actually to the photons, namely as a particle of light. So now the idea that we were relying on all along up to this point was the fact that light is a wave. We were able to explain everything that we knew about light there, including reflection and refraction by doing wave. And as a matter of fact, we were able to find the wavelength and the frequency of light. So it's not just a, uh, a convenience, but rather it's actually, um, actually it's a fact at that point. Now here comes another thing, which is now 
light actually needs to be a particle. So what is light then? Is it a particle or, 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 or a wave? It turns out light behaves both ways, as a wave and as a particle, depending on the experiment, depending on what you're doing with it. So there is this duality nature of light. Light can become a particle and a wave in the same time. And then you can refine the double select experiment to show either behavior, okay? Now, Mr. De Bruyne in the early uh, tw 1920s, he looked at the, this phenomenon, saying that light basically behaves like a wave and a particle. He postulated or he thought about it. Could it be possible the other way around? Could a particle also behave like a wave? An electron, for example, has a definite mass and momentum and everything else. Could an electron or a proton or any other matter for that matter behave also like a wave? So if it does, he was able to find the wavelength. So in other words, we have one way first, namely a wave, namely the light, behaving as a particle. Mr. De Bruyne suggested that, could it work the other way around too? And his idea was actually, was the only one to explain some scattering phenomena involving actually uh, electrons later on. So particles also behave like waves. So this duality was not unique to waves, actually it also works both ways. So particles and waves do the same thing. This led to a major revolution in physics. This led to the to Heisenberg essentiality principle. This led to also the, the, the uh, Schrodinger's equation and the rise of the most precise physics ever, namely quantum physics, the most precise science ever there is no science more precise than quantum mechanics, okay? So uh, this is basically where we are in modern physics. So uh, the end, we're gonna di 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 diverge a little bit backward in terms of history, trying to understand, for example, the spectral lines for hydrogen. Hydrogen has definite spectral lines and that was a puzzling. So how can we explain that? Uh, one of the problems before that was actually the electron was discovered. We know its charge. And we know the atom is not charged, must have some sort of a positive charge to counterbalance that of the, uh, the electrons. So if the electrons are part of the smaller, tiny uh, object that make matter and they are negatively charged, there must be an equal amount of positive charge to counterbalance that. So that is the hypothesis of the proton. So the proton must exist at least in the hydrogen atom exactly in the same proportions as the electrons to balance it. And that was fine, that was good, because we were able to basically understand that. However, as we started to look closer and closer, for example, and that was actually a Rutherford experiment. Before Rutherford's experiment, there was a hypothesis that, look, could it be, this is how the atom was visualized. You have like, 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 like a dough, for example, made out of a positive charge where electrons were swimming in it. And the charge in the dough is exactly equal to that of the electron so that the atom is neutral. Obviously, when Mr. Rutherford did the experiment, his famous experiment, he took foils of gold and silver and he bombarded them with alpha particles. And he noted that his alpha particles, which are positively charged, by the way, are hardly impacted by these foils. They go straight through. Some of them deflect a little, and some of them actually bounce back, but the vast majority of the alpha particle go unimpeded, suggesting that the, the, the positive charge is not like inside a dough and the, and, the negative, and the negative charge is floating it, but rather that the negative charge is somehow very far away from where the positive charge is, which is sitting in the center of the atoms. So that's the model that emerged from it, that the atom is mainly empty space. And for the most part, the positive charge is sitting in a very tiny region of space called the nucleus. And then the, the, the uh, negative charge is floating around it. So there was the immediate comparison to the solar system. Could it be that Coulomb's force, which is the attraction between positive charge and negative charge, provide the force necessary to keep the electrons going around the, around the uh, the nucleus, just like the planets do around the sun. If you have the sun in the center, 
a planet like the Earth, for example, is going around and around. It's held to, uh, in place by the law of gravity. Law of gravity is the one that keeps the Earth from floating in the, in the universe away from the sun. But that was rejected immediately because of the fact that if the electron is a negative charge, and it is, and it's going around the nucleus, it has to emit energy because any charged particle will emit energy. So the atom will not be stable. And all of the atoms in the universe should have collapsed on themselves a long, long time ago, immediately fraction of a second after they were formed. And that is not true. All the atoms exist and they're not collapsed on one another. So there was a problem in here. So we needed to explain what's going on. So Mr. Bohr suggested an idea. He said the following, that it's true. The electrons are still going around the, the, the nucleus. However, they're not going in a circular path, but rather in some sort of a resonance path. In such a way, their wavelength and uh, the perimeter in which they are going are in special ratio. And if that's the case, then by the time they complete one, by about uh, the time they complete one full cycle, they would have come a full wavelength to where they started from. So in other words, they would keep on going. So that led to a st stable atom. And as a matter of fact, his theory beautifully explained the, the spectral lines of the hydrogen atom. So it was actually amazing how it agreed with it. He tried to take the same model and explain with it some other things. For example, helium. If you look at the periodic table, hydrogen is the first element, then the next element is helium. It did not succeed at all. So there must be something else going on in the case of the, uh, uh, the atoms. So his theory was beautifully working out for the case of hydrogen or hydrogen-like atoms. Like for example, if you take a helium and you strip it off of, a, of one of the electrons, now you have nucleus that is positively charged, has two charges and, and, and only one electron. Then in this case, the spectral lines seem to work, to work with it. So either hydrogen or hydrogen-like atoms, it seems like it's working, but not for anything else. Of course, the advent of quantum mechanics explained everything. Explained the, 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 the spectral lines and it went step beyond and it gave us a beautiful model for the entire basically uh, structure of all of the atoms in the periodic table, all the known 92 elements, plus the ones that we made on the lab for a total of about 118 elements. So this is in a nutshell the chapter, the two chapters actually talking about this one again. So if you, somebody asks you what is light, is it particle or wave? It's actually depending on the experiment. It behaves both ways, just like the electron also it behaves sometimes like waves and sometimes like, uh, like uh, particles. So let me share with you the screen. So here are the topics of the day today. Again, the birth of quantum mechanics, quantum theory, that is the topic. Uh, the quantization and Planck's constant, that is how uh, he he basically, he, he won the Nobel Prize for it, although he basically did not intend that to, for it to be the way it was, but at the end, it was a smart, basically, or at least clever uh, thing to solve the problem of the, uh, the ultraviolet uh, catastrophe. And uh, the photoelectric effect is mainly Mr. Einstein, basically. And that is actually how Mr. Einstein also got his Nobel Prize, not because of relativity or equal to MC squared at that time or anything like that. He gained fame because of the photoelectric effect. And then uh, the wave particle the duality started with light. Then Mr. De Broglie suggested the idea, depending on how you say it, it's a French name, De uh, Broglie. But some people, they call it De Broglie, or some people, they call it De Broglie. So depending on how you say it, but the point being in here, he was actually working on his uh, PhD thesis. He was a student at the time when he suggested that. And again, that works also both ways. The double slit experiment, now the one that I discussed last time for the for for uh, Mr. Young when he did it on light, can actually be performed on 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 particles now, uh, electrons that is. Okay. And the particles as waves, electron diffraction, and which gives rise to electron microscopes, and there are a lot of applications for this one. I mentioned the uncertainty, Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which plays a major role in quantum mechanics in a sense that you cannot determine the position of a particle in quantum mechanics with an absolute certainty 
if you were to expect to have it to have its momentum. So if you do that, then the momentum will be a vague value. And same thing with the energy and time. So there is all kinds of uh, uncertainties, constraints in, 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 in physics. In a sense, this is what's going on. When you perform an experiment to determine something, you're actually impacting, you're influencing the, uh, the, 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 the object that you're trying to study. So that's really where the uncertainty in a sense is coming from. This is not, an error in measurement or shortcomings in the in the in the in the in the, uh, in the experimentation. It's actually an, uh, an, an inherent property of the of the particles. Whether you're conducting the measurements or not, the uncertainty principle is there. So it's not like because we can't do it, because we don't have sophisticated equipment enough that we get so much errors. No, it's actually because this is an, an inherent property of particles that they have this this thing and yeah that's just what quantum mechanics is telling us basically complementarity later on we'll talk about it and how uh, uh, the laws of physics basically come together between classical physics and quantum mechanics and again uh, the second part now deals with the discovery of the atomic nucleus this is basically the fact the experiment that mr rutherford conducted the discovery of the electron, the spectral lines, which are mainly due, Mr. Reitberg came up with an explanation for them, a mathematical explanation, but just some explanation. Then we're gonna talk about the Bohr's model. Bohr's model, a word of caution here. Uh, there is a model is a representation of something, okay? Sometimes it's better to go through a model than to have actual a picture of something, an actual depiction of something. Because if you look, for example, at the distribution of the electron around the nucleus, it's going to be a very messy thing to look at. But it's much easier sometimes to look at it in terms of energy levels and in terms of uh, energy shells and stuff like that. Makes the description a lot more uh, 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 easier and a lot better in a sense because that can lead to results that you can explain in the laboratory much easier. Okay. So explanation of quantized energy levels, the electron waves, and then quantum mechanics and the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle is the one actually that uh, corresponds between classical mechanics and uh, and uh, and uh, quantum mechanics in the sense that in the limit when the sizes become too big, then we rederive, if you wish, classical mechanics, F equals to MA and everything that we learned up to this point. Quite a big thing. Okay, so there has been, like I said, uh, a long historical debate about the nature of light. So this is the point that I started with, is light a particle or is light a wave? Early suggestions that Mr. Uh, Newton has suggested was a corpuscular th a theory of light, that light is made up of tiny particles and those type of tiny particles can explain the phenomenon of reflection and fraction. Later on in the double slit experiment of Mr. Young, it showed beyond the shadow of the doubt that it was a wave and we were able to find the wavelength and the frequency of such, uh, such, uh, such, uh, such waves. Uh, Max Planck in 1900 hypothesized that radiant energy was emitted in discrete bundles, each of which were, he called quantum. Okay? So the quanta of energy was able to explain the black body radiation. So that is basically where we stood at that time. So we went full circles basically. And right now, as I said before, the full exception is that light does both. So again, quantum physics states that in the micro world of the quantum, the, the energy is quantized, not, this, not continuous value, but discrete values, okay? The quanta of light and of electromagnetic is, are called photons. So photons are the particles of light. They're the messenger, the messengers of the, of the electromagnetic interactions. So they carry information. For example, the electron is going to interact with another electron by repelling it. So what they do, they exchange photons. So that is what they are. This is actually in the lingo and the language of modern physics, which is even more quantum field theory, which is even more precise than this, this quantum mechanics. The energy is related to the frequency. This H is just a constant. H is just a number. Like for example, the speed of light H is just a number, it's 6.626 .6 times 10 to the negative 34, something, something, which is joule times second. It's a very tiny number. It's a very small number. Had H been any bigger than this, 10 to the negative 34, you know what that means. It's 0.000000, 0 .000 000, 33 zeros, 
and then six in here. So a very, very small number. Had this number been a bigger number, uh, this effects will be seen at a higher level. The reason why we don't see this effects on a daily basis is because our sizes are much, much bigger than this number. So that's why we don't see them. Again, F is just the frequency and E is the energy. So this is the energy of a specific photon where H is a fixed number. It doesn't change at all, okay? And he was able to find the value of H just basically by going through the black body radiation and seeing exactly the spectrum of the black body radiation, which goes like this. It peaks at some temperature T depending on the material. And, and that is actually the lambda and that is a maximum value T. Now, uh, the frequency is actually F. So F is a frequency. So E equals to H times F. F is a frequency and E is the energy and H is Planck's constant. Make sense? Do you say H is constant? H is constant. H is Planck's constant. Okay, guys, so it's um, constant times frequency for energy yes. of quanta. Yes, for the quanta of energy. Uh, the main thing in here is this constant is just a constant, just like a number. It's 6.62, .6 like pi, if you wish, 10 to the negative 34. It's a very tiny number, though, extremely small number. That is the only thing that is. And how do we find it? We found it through this, this analysis, basically, of the uh, of the emission of the black body radiation. For instance. Take a spoon and heat it up. Do the experiment and find the intensity that is emitted and compare that and to the theory that is needed to make that work for you. And you will find the AH, and that's how you get this number in your extremely small number. Okay. You can think of H like the speed of light. Speed of light is a big number, though. It's 300 million meters per second. Per second. So that is uh, actually another constant. Okay or G if you want to, G, big G, that we saw, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Again, you can plug in the numbers in here. What is it? Newton uh, meter squared divided by kilogram squared. Okay, so all of these are constants. So the universe that we live in has a bunch of constants so, um, that, that, that are there. One other constant is the electric charge, for example, 1.602 10 to the negative 19 Coulomb, which is just another constant. Okay, so all of these things are constants and they can, they're useful for our measurement. So this H was introduced by Planck. As I was saying, in the beginning was really apologetic, but it didn't make sense to him. Why the energy is quantized? There was no reason for him to have it, but he's explained this thing. As a matter of fact, this experiment of the black body radiation was one of the most precise experiments that matched the theory beautifully to the point that it makes you suspicious. Were this curve cooked just enough to match the theory? I mean, did somebody cheat in making the curves? That's what I need months to, because there is a perfect match between them, okay? So the photoelectric effect is quanti the quantization that the word uh, uh, is granular rather than smooth quantum. So basically I explained to, to the fact that what the photoelectric effect is, you have a metal and you expose it to light. So here is light coming in here with a certain frequency. The frequency needs to be higher than a certain cutoff frequency. If it is less, the electron is not going to be emitted, okay? If it is equal to or more than that frequency, yes, it's going to be emitted. Regardless of the intensity, which is kind of weird because you would think that the more intense light, then you would free up uh, the electron. No, that's it. Now, of course, the uh, more intense light, the more electrons you're going to free. That's, that's true. So if you send three beams, you're gonna have three electrons, for example, if each and every one of them gets a beam, an electron. So that is true. However, so in other words, the current will increase at some point, okay? However, uh, if you want to see the phenomenon at all, you'll have to have the frequency above a certain cutoff. So suggesting 
that the, this particles are actually momentum and the momentum is actually proportional to the frequency, the, the, the frequency too. So the energy is true is equal to HF. And from here, you can work your way backward trying to find what the, what the, free, what the momentum is. So it has to be a particle. It's like, here is the photoelectric effect probably better explained with this experiment. So if you shine light that has this right frequency, okay, the correct frequency, or at least some of its frequency is higher than a certain minimum frequencies, you're going to free up electrons in here from the cathode that they're going to be floating Obviously, if you accelerate them in here with the voltage, they're going to start moving in here. If you apply a voltage in the opposite direction, you're going to stop them. So the electrons, they will emerge with a certain kinetic energy after they come out. So if there is no battery in here, the circuit will be completed. But if you take a battery and put it in the opposite direction, so the electrons that are coming in here, because this is positive and this is, this is the, the, the electrons that are coming in here, actually they will be reversed, okay? No, 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 I'm sorry, we're accelerating right now. We're accelerating that. Anyway, you can detect the electron flow within a galvanometer, okay? So again, the photo, more light ejects more electrons, that's it. Now the frequency, as I said, low frequency, no matter how bright the light is, it's not gonna do anything. So get, get a very intense light if you like, as long as the frequency is low, it's not gonna eject a single electron. But the high frequency, even with a dim light, is going to inject, uh, it's going to eject electrons. So you're gonna see them. So that's what the feather photoelectric effect. So Mr. Einstein proposed the idea of the photons. Okay. So a stream of particles, bundles of energy, that is what light is. Photons interact with matter at one at a time. High energy photons dislodge electrons from certain matter. So that is basically the photoelectric effect. It explains beautifully the photoelectric effect and there is no problem with it. So now we are faced with this dilemma. As I said, the photoelectric effect especially and young experiments, so young experiments basically conclude that light is a wave. Now the photoelectric effect, which is another experiment, suggests that light is made up of tiny particles. Called photons. So here we have what is known as a duality that light, because this is documented, this is true. And so is this one actually too. So light now can behave both of them depending on the experiment that you're conducting. So initially with low intensity it's behaving like particles, but then if you wait long enough for this low intensity to build up, even if you have, you're sending one light at the time, one photon at a time. So if the intensity is very low, it's going to look like it's particles and it is behaving like particles, like photons, like this dots in here. But if you let the exposure long enough in here, it's going to superimpose and give you all of these patterns that the waves do where they will be constructive in some points and destructive in some other points in there. So in other words, it's going to reproduce back the image that you would have if you just sent it through with a high intensity, which is waves. So intensity in here, or at least the number of photons that are interacting in here can make the difference. Sometimes we have like waves, I mean particles and sometimes like waves, okay? So this is the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment made no shadow, no, no, no question about it, that the fact that this is actually a, 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 a wave. The only way to explain this difference in kind of a brightness and uh, darkness, bright fringes versus dark fringes, the central fringe is always, I don't know where the central is, is it? Why did it come out dark? So this is the central fringe, power fringe followed by dark, bright, dark, bright, and that is actually, unless this is actually where the exposure is. Anyway, so there is an alternance in this case, and the only way to explain the alternance is via the, 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 the wave nature of light. If you come in here, 
and you block one of these two, it doesn't matter which, you're going to get an image that look like this, only one big light and nothing else, okay? But then when you open both of them, then you have this patterns of, uh, of interference that are unique to waves, okay? If one photon at a time, it looks like it's again particles, but then if you wait it exposed for a long time, you recover again your 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 uh, your fringes again. Okay, this is if you cover one of them, this is how the image would look like, suggesting that there is no interference because you only have one source. Okay, so again, so that is the whole point of the double slit experiment. Again, particles as waves. That is actually due to Mr. De Broglie. He suggests the opposite. Because the momentum for a particle, or the momentum for light, for light, you can say the momentum is this Planck's constant, which is h again divided by the wavelength. So this was true. So now if you give me a wave, I can give you a particle. It has a momentum. Particle is like mass times velocity. Okay. But the photon doesn't really have mass, yet it behaves like mass times velocity. And you ask me how much its value is, it's h over the wavelength. A photon has definitely a wavelength. And if you work out the math in here, it looks like as if it's mass times velocity. But remember, that is what the momentum is, that there is no mass for the photon. So this number should really be zero. But that's what this experiments of the photoelectric effects are saying. This whole thing is saying that there is a momentum as if there is a mass, but we know which, there could not be a mass. So that's what the whole trouble with this whole thing argument in here is. So Louis de Broglie suggested the following. Could it work the other way around? Because the equation looks very, very simple. This is middle school algebra. If momentum is equal to h over wavelength, then I can have wavelength equal to uh, h over momentum. In other words, an electron that definitely has a mass and definitely has a velocity, which means that it has a momentum, then I can find the wavelength for it using this equation, backward equation, basically. Because of, uh, an electron, for example, has a mass. And when it's moving, it has a velocity. So it has a momentum. H is constant. H is just a fixed number, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. That doesn't change. So if you give me this too, I can cook for you a wavelength. I could come up with a wavelength for you. And now we have everything that we need. As a matter of fact, if we take an electron whose mass is 9, 10 to the negative 31 kilogram, and let's say, for example, it's moving with a tenth of the speed of light, which is 30 times 10 to the power uh, 300, 30 million basically meters. Remember 300 million meters per second is the speed of light. So it's momentum from this expression is nine times 30, which is no, it's nine times three is 27, 270 times 10 to the negative 31 divided by minus uh, six is going to be what? Negative 25, okay? So now forget about this 274 right now or 2.7 times 10 to the negative 23. So for the most part, it's 10 to the negative 34 divided by 10 to the negative 23. And that is roughly 10 to the negative 11, uh, the wavelength meters, which is 0 0.1 angstrom, which is smaller than the size of the atom. The wavelength of light, the, 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 the shortest wavelength is about 400 nanometers, okay? And 400 nanometers is four times 10 to the negative seven. The atom is about 10 to the negative nine, okay? So this is much, much bigger, the visible light. The shortest wavelength is much, much bigger than the atom, okay? By a factor of almost 100 times bigger. So if this is the light, this is where the atom is. This is the shortest uh, wavelength, which is for the blue light, okay? It's, if it's a meter long, the light, it's one centimeter, the atom on that scale. 
But now for the electron, because of this relationship, if it's true, of course, and it is now, you know that, then its wavelength is of the same size of the atom. So we can use it to see the atom. That's how we took pictures of the atom, actually, using uh, electron, micro, micro, uh, electron microscopes. Okay? Very powerful stuff. Again, that is Mr. De Bruyne. He took this idea and he flipped it around. He said, could I do it? Is it possible? He was working on his PhD, the poor guy who was a student. And it turns out that he was right, okay? So again, this is light giving you different fringes in here. That's the interference. And this is the electron microscope. See the power of it now? It can give you extreme high resolution of a lot of things, much better than regular microscopes, the microscope that uses regular light. Because as I was saying, the regular light has a wavelength of the order of 10 to the negative seven meters or 0 0.1 micrometer, okay? And the size of bacteria is over the order of a micrometer. So they are not really very much useful to take pictures of a bacteria. To use this guy in here, that has a resolution of the order of 0 0.1 nanometer. So for them, those objects are huge. So bacteria would be a tremendous big in here, like this picture, extreme high resolution of it. Because even if you use this one, which is the order of a bacteria, you're gonna get a fuzzy picture. You're not gonna get a clear picture with a regular light. So this is light. But with a microscope, with an electron uh, microscope, you're going to get tremendously precise pictures that are that has a lot of details. This hair of this thing is extremely small size, but you get all kinds of details of it. Now, obviously, you're not going to get tremendous high resolution of an atom, even with a microscope, electron microscope, because of the fact that the order of magnitude is similar. But you can at least attempt to get a better picture than what you do with regular light. Okay. The uncertainty principle, I mentioned the fact that uh, uh, there is an uncertainty in here that is native to, to, to the measure, to, to the theory itself, namely the fact that you cannot know something precisely about its position when you would want to know its velocity if you want to, its momentum in general, okay? So there is a trade-off. You can only know so much about something. And the cutoff is actually, uh, the Planck's constant divided by two. Actually, it's a reduced Planck's constant divided by two. It's one over two times 10 to the negative 34, okay? That's why the uncertainty principle on, on the microscopic level, for example, on Newton's laws of motion does not show up at all. You can measure the speed of the car with tremendous accuracy, and you can measure its location with tremendous accuracy. Take a ruler and you can find exactly where the car is located. And you can take the odometer or whatever your laser gun, for example, and find how fast the, the, the car is moving or the, the, the fly is moving in front of you or whatever you would want to, because their size usually is very, very large compared to this number. So that's why this, this thing doesn't make sense on a classical level, but it's now more suitable for the microscopic world. Then it matters a lot. So you cannot know, for example, the position and momentum with absolute certainty. Absolute certainty. This is usually with all kinds of variables. Like, for example, the same thing, energy and time. Same thing cannot know that with absolute certainty, both of them at the same time. One of them has to give in, okay? So this is the mathematical expression for it. That is written, it's actually H bar over two. And H bar is just a number, okay? Just like H, except that it's 1.054 times 10 to the negative 34. It's extremely small number, okay? That's why in the macroscopic level, this number is practically zero. So what I'm saying in here is that he, the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty of the position on the macroscopic level is greater than or equal to zero. What if it's zero, then in this case, both of them can be zero when you have no problem whatsoever, okay? In other words, there is no uncertainty on either because this number is so small on the macroscopic level. 
But on the microscopic level, it becomes significant because look at the mass of the electron. The mass of the electron is 9, 10, 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And this number is only 10 to the negative 34. So we are not talking too far from each other. But the mass of a car is about 10 to the power three kilograms versus this number A, it's too much, okay? It's negligible. So the delta in here is the uncertainty. How uncertain are you? That's all, okay? And as I said before, the same thing applies between the energy and time too. So this is actually some of the foundation that is actually in quantum mechanics. This is the Heisenberg. It's not the same Heisenberg from the popular movie, uh, what is that, Breaking Bad? Actually, that's where the idea probably was borrowed from. Okay. Principle plus only to quantum mechanics because of the fact that the quantum mechanics things are extremely small, where each bar now becomes significant player. It does not apply to macroscopic laboratory measurements, like for example, how fast a car is moving and where it is, okay? The shield of nature is secret, the notion that science is basically uncertain. This led to Mr. Einstein because of the fact that now we're dealing with probability of the fact that he cannot really know something 100%, and there is all kinds of ties in here. So Mr. Einstein has this famous statement. They said that, well, if we're looking at quantum mechanics, probably we're looking at the wrong science. He suspected that it cannot be probably 100% true because of the fact that it is probabilistic in nature. And he said his famous statement that God does not play in vice. But of course, that's exactly what it is. Nature is probabilistic on this level, on the microscopic level. Okay, this is a complementary to the fact that the, uh, please do not push this kind of into a philosophical uh, statements in here. I don't know about the, what the yin yang mean, but the point being in here is that, look, there is a duality in uh, physics and that duality exists depend in particles, there is actually no limits between this. This is a fuzzy limit between them. Like for example, the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, wave versus nature, wave versus particle, okay? And in this case, for example, you have momentum and position and so on and so forth, okay? But there's this, this things that appear kind of a thing in there. Don't push it too much into philosophy and start to argue based on it whether or not. One of the mistakes that a lot of people do, including physicists, by the way, is they take their own field of, of uh, expertise and they make it into some sort of uh, statements about politics or statements about religion or statements about uh, philosophy, which is really not what they were intended for. And that's really harmful to physics in general if we do that. Okay, that's at least my opinion. And I know it's probably not physics, but that's a point in here. Let's stick with what we know. From physics. Anyway, the, the atom and the quantum world. Again, this is rather for the experiment. So when he did the experiment, because at that time we were kind of facing the following model for the, for, since we know that there are electrons, definitely electrons. So to explain what's going on in here, maybe if they have three electrons in here and in, in, uh, this is the lithium, then in this case, we have some sort of a dough of positive charge that must add up exactly to this three electrons so that they're uh, they canceled. So if that's the case, that looks nice. Why? Because everything is sitting in place and we have everything that, so at some point when the electron is ejected, it becomes part of the current and so on and so forth. But so Mr. Rutherford tried to test this hypothesis by running alpha particles. Alpha particles, if you guys remember, are just helium, ionized helium. So they come from radioactivity, from radioactive materials and they come already with tremendous speed. So all he has to do is focus them because they have positive charge. So we can use electric field and magnetic field to focus them and then have them go through foils. In this case, zinc sulfide, for example. No, actually that's the screen. So it's a gold foil actually, or and, uh, and silver foils. So that he noticed for the most part, they go unimpeded. Occasionally they'll go, they bent a little one way or the other, or they're actually going back. But for the most part, they go completely uh, 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 unaffected by the presence of this foil. So this, that suggests that this model is not correct for the atom, but rather that the positive charge is sitting right in the center in here, 
and the electrons are floating far away from it. And that's why these alpha particles went through completely, unless they come very close in here, in which case they return, they interact with the positive charge. Or if they come nearby, they are going to be bent one way or the other. But for the most part, the atom is empty space. That's basically in a nutshell what the Rutherford experiment is. So the atomic nucleus is very, very tiny. As a matter of fact, the distance that we're talking about in here is of the order of 10 to the negative 15 meters. That means it's 0 0.0, 14 zeros before the first number in here, okay? Let's so say, for example, it's a one meter. It's extremely small. Whereas the atom, as I was saying in the beginning, is of the order of 10 to the negative nine meters, okay? So the atom is about 10 to the power six. Actually, it's slightly smaller than that, but it's 10 to the power six, 10 to the power five, bigger. So if this is the atom, the nucleus, you have to go about 10,000 10, times to 100,000 times to find where the electrons are, okay? So this entire thing region is empty space. If you take, for example, the model of the sun, the sun versus the, 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 the earth, the sun has a diameter of roughly 1.5 million kilometers, okay? The earth sits about 150 million kilometers. So you only have to go about a hundred times. So if we, if this was the sun, the earth would be only about a hundred times. So the solar system is not as empty as the atom. Of course, you have to go about 10,000 to a hundred thousand times to find where the electrons are. So in other words, if this was the sun, the earth would be further than even the, the, the earth. It's going to be somewhere in the earth cloud way past Neptune, way past uh, Pluto in order to find where the Earth is. It's tremendous distances. So the analogy with the, with the solar system is completely not correct. I mean, uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, if the nucleus was the sun and the Earth diameter, it has to be completely outside of the known solar system right now in order to find where the Earth is, let alone where the other planets are, okay? So that should give you an idea of the sizes. So for the vast majority, the atom is an empty space. That is, if you compare the size of the uh, nucleus, which is a huge size compared to the electron. Electron size is practically no size at all, okay? So now this distance is a huge distance compared to the Earth-Sun model. Again, the electrons, were discovered a long time ago, and actually its mass was discovered uh, by Mr. Melikan's experiment. So this is Thompson's experiment, okay? And based on which way they bend and their magnetic field, that's how we determine their charges. And based on Mr. Melikan's experiment, we were actually able to find its mass, okay? Thompson experiment that reason that the amount of beams deflection depend on the mass of the particle, the greater, so even the uh, Thompson's experiment was able to give me the ratio of E over M actually, the ratio of the charge over the mass of the electron. Now, this experiment of Millikan was able to give me the charge. So we found all the charges are multiples of this number, 1.0602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So we know the charge of the electron. We know the ratio of E over M. From here, we were able to find the mass of the electron. The electron was the first particle to be found, actually, all of its properties, okay? Then, in this case, we know something else must give because we know the mass of the hydrogen atom, for example, is much, much heavier than this one. As a matter of fact, the hydrogen atom is about the order of 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And since the only two things in town are electrons, and protons that we, we have to have in here to have a positive charge to, to balance this negative charge, then the protons must be mainly this mass. As a matter of fact, they are. The proton is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, which is mainly the mass of the, of, the, of the hydrogen atom. So that was perfect. Everything looks good. For helium though, there was a problem. 
for helium, the mass seems to be four times as much as what we expected. So you have two electrons, which are negligible, but instead of having just the two positive charges, which is just to be two times this number, we found that the number actually was four times. So now we start to suspect that, the, hey, there is a charge, there is another kind of matter that exists inside the nucleus that is actually has no charge in it, should not impact the charge, but impacts the mass. And that is where the hypothesis for the neutron was made. So we know the mass of the, uh, the proton because of the hydrogen atom. But now as we started to look into different uh, materials, especially kinds of isotopes, for example, uh, uh, helium has two isotopes, helium three and helium four, where it seems like there is a discrepancy in mass, the chemical properties are the same, namely they have the same number of electrons. But the protons must be the same because they must balance the number of electrons. But one of them seems to have twice of that particle and the other one has only one of them. And that is where the hypothesis of the neutron started to come through. And then later on, it was discovered on its own because it's very hard to, uh, to play with neutrons because they don't have charge. If you send a neutron, for example, through a magnetic field, it's going to go through, or an electric field is going to go through. It doesn't have charge. Q is equal to zero for it, okay? So that was kind of weird in the sense that a particle that has comparable mass but does not have a uh, charge. So that's how we arrived at that things. So there was some sort of a sequence into how we know what we know today. It's very fascinating stuff. Again, one of the things that also suggests the structure of the atom was the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the hydrogen spectrum, especially, I mean, because it has visible light. There are some frequencies that you can see with your own eye. If you take a film and develop it and run, for example, excite a gas of hydrogen, you're going to see specific lines with specific colors, red color, blue color, and then there is another kind of violet color. So there is all kinds of colors that you're gonna see them, but three or four of them. And those lines were unique to hydrogen. So we know about them. Other elements have actually different spectral lines too, but we wanted to understand where is that coming from, okay? So uh, Reitberg actually came up with a mathematical explanation for this, this numbers in here. It seems like the difference in here between these transitions, they follow special, special mathematical law. And he basically was able to find the constant that is between them. And if you go from n equals to one to two to three, they are actually inversely proportional to n squared. So this idea, then suggested that maybe this energy level models is, is what, what's going on. In other words, for transitions between one level to another level and between one level to another level and another level to another level, that is what we're looking at. So the red light probably corresponds to this transition, which is of less energy than the second light in here, which is the green light, because this energy gap is in here bigger. Versus, for example, this energy, which has a higher frequency, that's why the color is shifted toward the blue, uh, then it's an, from a higher level to a, to, a, to a lower level in this case. So that's basically the model that we're looking at at that point. However, there was a problem with this, this, this whole thing. If we look at it and say, okay, the atom is really going on, what's going on in here is that you have a nucleus in the center, positive charge, and you have an electron floating because again, as I, say, I was saying, the electron must go and flow inside and basically die out because it's going to lose energy and it's going to lose energy in the form of radiation. That is what we know from classical mechanics. That's what we know from electricity and magnetism. Take a chart and move it. And it's going to uh, uh, radiate energy. That's how antennas work actually. The, 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 the power, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, radio station that sends signal or your tower that sends signal to your phone the cell phone company, it's basically have charges moving back and forth in the, in the dipole antennas and the charge moves back and forth at specific rate that they dictate, okay? The signal is going to propagate because of the energy that is radiated. And the only reason why it keeps moving back and forth is because of the power supply. If you cut the power supply, the charges will come to rest. They will not move anymore. So as long as there is a power supply supplying the antenna, the charges are moving back and forth. And in doing so, they 
radiate energy in the form of electric field and magnetic field that your antenna in your own cell phone or your own TV or whatever, your radio or whatever, is going to receive that signal again and the charges in it start to move back and forth, which is later on amplified and demodulated, actually separated from the carrier and the actual signal. And then you have, you can watch TV or you can listen to somebody talking to you from the other end of the, the, the universe, but not the other, the other end of the planet, I should say. From Japan, you can listen to somebody talking to you live as we speak. Okay, that is because charges radiate energy. So if that's the true thing, then because the particle as it's moving around the circle, in this case it's it's accelerating, and when a charge is accelerating, it's always going to radiate energy. So that model is not correct because of this classical mechanics. So there must be something else going on there. So Louis de Broglie hypothesized that the wave is associated with every particle. Uh, so again, this is actually due to Mr. Niels Bohr. Here is what he suggested. He's saying that these are actually standing waves. And standing waves are resonance, no more. If a given number of wavelength, this is a wavelength from peak to peak. From peak to peak is another wavelength. From peak to peak is another wavelength. From peak to peak is another wavelength. I have how many? One, two, three, four, five uh, wavelengths. If the parameter, which is just the circumference of this circle, the circumference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. This is the circumference, the path basically of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the electrons is an integer multiple of that. This is n, which is just can be one, it can be two, it can be three, and so on and so forth. Okay, it cannot be zero because if it's zero, you don't have an electron because how are we going to make a wavelength? Because remember, an electron is actually a wave now. Okay. If you have zero length, then you don't have an electron. So it has to be at least one full wavelength. I don't know how I'm going to draw one full wavelength. This is one full wavelength and wrap it around in a circle. Okay? That is the fundamental energy level. Okay? You have two wavelengths. I have too many now. That's one. That is two. Okay? You have two wavelengths. You can wrap them again around. Basically take this one in here and turn it around and connect it together. And now you have standing wave, okay? And so on and so forth, okay? So the point in here, if they don't match in here, well, the wave breaks and then the, uh, the electron cannot be stable. So it has to move to a higher energy level or lower energy level for this situation to happen. This can never exist. It's not even a transition in between, not even a transition. So you have an electron sitting, for example, in n equals to one, and it wants to go to n equals to two. It doesn't go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way to the, I mean, 1.1, 1 1, I should say, 1.2 and 1.5 and until 1.999 and then two. No, it has n equals to one, absorbs light that corresponds to that transition, Bang, it finds itself in n equals to two. That's it. Emits light, if it's sitting in here, emits the frequency of light, and then all of its energy now jumps and back comes back into n equals to one. It's not a continuous process. This is a forbidden region. It cannot exist there. So again, this is the same explanation we we're talking about in here. This led to a beautiful explanation of the Rydberg the formula and the, the, at least the, the spectral lines for the hydrogen and everything else was beautifully explained using this, this model, okay? So again, this is basically what I was talking about in here. This is n equals to one, n equals to two, n equals to three wavelengths and so on and so forth. So this is actually the Niels Bohr's model. Obviously, it's not, it did not work for any other atoms, and that's the problem with it. We were led to a new mechanics that actually 
came out to be, and this is the famous Schrodinger's equation. I know we're not in a level where we should solve this kind of equations, but I really want you guys to think a little bit about it. I met a lady in one of the colleges, one of the conferences were actually in a college, and uh, she told me about the complex numbers. She said that there is one thing that I learned in high school, and I never thought, and it's, it, there is no meaning whatsoever for it, and that is complex numbers. You guys have not heard of them. Complex numbers, they're the square root of a negative number, like square root of a negative one. Uh, when you square a number, it's always positive. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. For example, if you take two and you square it, it's going to be four. You take negative two and you square it, it's going to be positive four also, because negative two times negative two, the negative times negative is positive, so this is four nonetheless. Take any two numbers, you square them, you're going to have a positive number. Doesn't matter, negative, for example, three times negative three. Well, in this case, the negative times negative is gonna be positive and the answer is gonna be positive nine. If you take a positive three times a positive three, that two is positive nine. Then physicists and scientists introduced complex number, where if you square this number, it's a negative number. So don't trap your head around it. I mean, don't try to wrap your head around it because it doesn't exist. It's not real. This number is actually called an imaginary number for a reason because you cannot think about it. I mean, it does not exist. It's not real. It's an imaginary. It's not, not in the real numbers, okay? You cannot have an I apple, for example, but you can have one apple and you can have two apples and you can have two and a half apples and you can have whichever divisions of apples you want. So those numbers are real but you cannot have a two eye apple or one eye apple. Here is an eye apple, doesn't exist. It's an imaginary apple. So the same thing with here with these things. So I told her the following, probably you'd never have seen uh, Schrodinger's equation. Because Schrodinger's equation, the first term in it is an I. It's an imaginary number. So this equation really is a mathematical equation that describes the so-called wave function and the wave function is not real, is also a complex number. But the beauty of this whole thing, and this is what I'm telling you that, you come up with something that doesn't exist in real life, which is wave function, imaginary numbers. And you come up with the most elegant, the most accurate theory known in science, not just in physics. More precise than any measurement you're doing, Basically, chemistry, all of chemistry is dependent on this equation. Everything you go and do in chemistry is dependent on this equation. Everything you do in solid state and material science is dependent on this equation. This is the equivalent of F equals to MA when it comes to the science. Remember F equals to MA, Newton's third law of new emotion? This was big deal. This is Newton's law of motion, but this is actually an approximation. This is not correct. This is only almost true. We can actually get this one from here. This is more fundamental than the other one. This is actually the equivalent of F equals to MA at this level. And this becomes a consequence of it. This is only true when you ignore H when you make h equal to zero. This becomes true. This is true because h is not zero. Here it is, actually, it's h bar. h bar is the same as h divided by 6.28, okay? That's why the number for this one is 1 1.054 times 10 to the negative 34. If you make this number tiny, and this is also the same h, by the way, this equation, can somehow be converted into this equation. That's all, okay? It has the mass of the particle. It has this ugly looking delta backward called the nabla operator or the del operator. It has all of this U. The main thing that you take from this one in here is that this is a complex equation. It has imaginary numbers in it. Uh, describing something called the wave function. Okay, that if you manipulate the wave function, you can get everything you want to know about the, uh, the, the particle, everything. It's momentum, it's energy, it's position, 
or at least the path that it does describes and its interactions and its conductivity, it's all the properties that you can think of are all derived from this psi, this function. This is a Greek letter psi, by the way. Okay. So we can derive anything from it, anything we want to know. But the function itself doesn't exist in real life. Let's go back into that point that was uh, the yin yang. So, in a sense, that is, in a sense, what it is. So, you have something that doesn't exist in real life, but gives you everything you would want to know in real life. Nice, isn't it? It doesn't make much sense in my head, but yeah, it sounds cool. And look, let me tell you a story, okay? And this is true, okay? This is absolutely true. I was teaching a calc-based physics course based on these things, which is complicated stuff to even conceive in your head. It looks like it's kind of a tongue twisting things. You're trying to use conflicting words basically in the same sentence. And it was in, we were in the lab and doing calculations. And one of the students basically she said, and in front of all of her classmates, you know, the, I can do the math, she said, but I don't believe it. I raise both of my hands like this in the sky. That's all I expect from you down there. <laughs> and everybody else, because nobody understands these things. If you try to make sense of it, you can't. That's the whole thing. If you try to, because it's not common everyday experience that you see these things. You don't see a wave and a particle working together and all of a sudden changing colors going back and forth. You don't see that. That's why it doesn't, it's kind of, if you try to see it, and if you think you know it, I think you're wrong. So this is actually what I tell them when I teach physics three. I tell them, we're starting a new branch of physics because we would have covered the classical mechanics and we would have covered the, at that time, electricity and magnetism. And those are fine. We can go through them. We understand them when we do experiments and everything looks beautiful and everything else. But I tell them, no, usually classroom size is about 20 students or something. We are about 20 of us in here, in here sitting together, together. At this point in, the, in time, there is only one person who doesn't know anything about this quantum mechanics. And that's me. I don't understand it. I'm hoping at the end of the course, at the end of the semester, that all of you don't understand it too. Because if you do, <laughs> you're, you're, there is something wrong. But I'm hoping that you can do the math and that is really what the power of this branch of physics is. Good? Oh, no, not really, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so don't feel bad about it, okay? Because if your instructor doesn't understand it, the people who put it trying to explain it, they can't really explain it that way. I mean, at least in a common sense, everyday experience. But the trick with it is, you can do the most precise measure, uh, uh, calculations that if confronted in the laboratory, they give you tremendous accuracy, outstanding accuracy. Nothing else can match it. I mean, 14 digits behind the zero, behind the decimal point, they're all matching the experiment one at a time. There is no science out there that can make such a claim, except this one, okay? So that's really what, what the power of this thing is. So if you can do the math, get through it, and know that you are at this level, you are dealing with this nasty H bar that messes up everything everywhere uh, for you, at least in your in your in your everyday visualization, you're in good shape. Okay. So when she said that, I've had both of my hands in the, <laughs> in the air. I said, that's that's it. That's exactly what I want you to say. You can do the math but you don't understand it because I don't understand it either. And nobody on the, on the planet can understand it with a common sense everyday experience, okay? Okay, so this is Schrodinger's equation. You have probably heard of it, okay? So, and the famous Schrodinger's cat and all of these things and here and the common literature and everything else. So in Schrodinger's wave equation, the thing that waves is the non-material matter wave matter wave amplitude. So in this case, it's a non-material, it's not real, okay? A mathematical entity called the wave function represented by the symbol psi, the Glee crater psi. All the information about the matter is contained in there, contained in it. So you can retrieve bits and pieces off of it. 
and you can retrieve whatever you want off of it. But itself has no meaning. Itself, psi, can visualize it. You can even draw it. I mean, you can draw it on screen. You can do a cartoon of it, I mean, like sine or cosine and everything else. But try to explain it away, OK? So again, this is the wave equation. It gives us beautiful description of the orbitals, for example, of the different, uh, the different molecules, different atoms, and how they interact, and gives us everything that we would want to know about the atom and the molecules and the condensed matter, everything that we would want to know about them. The equation itself is this ugly looking equation. Okay. I mean, this is not an easy equation to handle, even for seasoned mathematicians. Okay. This is not something that you can, most of the times you do it by approximations. Again, the correspondence principle I mentioned in the beginning, and actually it's stated in here somehow, that recovering classical mechanics from quantum mechanics is, uh, is, 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 is actually uh, something that is built into the theory itself. In other words, classical mechanics is just an approximation of this physics. So this is actually more precise than 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 classical mechanics, ethical MA and everything else that we learned before. They are just actually uh, hidden inside of it. And in a sense that if the system grows now big, we should be able to get everything that we would want to know about the system. Obviously, this is a hard way of doing it. Why don't you start with classical mechanics when you are the conditions for the classical mechanics, which you can visualize with your head, a car on an incline, for example, or uh, a ball, for example, on the client, you can describe its kinetic energy, potential energy, its velocity, and everything else. Better than having to start with this equation, because if you do it this way, it's an overkill. And you're going to waste a lot of valuable time before you arrive to a result. A result. But again, it doesn't hurt to sometimes use the classical approach to see what's going on. For example, if you have, a, if you have let's say, for example, the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has a nucleus that is a positive charge and an electron that is a negative charge. I expect from classical mechanics that if the electron is very far away from the proton, it's not going to feel the effect of the, of the, uh, of the proton. That's, that's something that we know from classical mechanics because Coulomb's force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So that's what we know from classical mechanics. The force drops with the one over distance squared. So we expect the electron somehow to be near the proton in this case to be to be uh, its its uh, its behavior. Now we go and calculate and do these things, and we find actually the result that we have found expected. And we're in good shape because we used we took advantage of classical mechanics in here in making some assumption of behavior at the very far. Because the equation, as I was saying, is very hard to solve. Take advantage of what you know from classical mechanics to make it manageable and doable. So. This is an entire T, the story of quantum mechanics, which is really a fascinating story, which is really one of the most fun things. Uh, yet, when it comes to modern physics, and I know there's some another topic coming down the road, namely relativity and, uh, and uh, both uh, uh, special and uh, general theory of relativity, that is going to have a completely different twist to it. That is understandable, understandable. That theory is actually much, much easier than this one to conceive and work with and do stuff with it. But it's actually antagonist to this one from the foundation itself, from the heart of it. This is a probabilistic theory, whereas the other one is actually more of a deterministic theory. So, and both of them actually, they have the limit as a classical mechanics, which makes that what we learned so far from classical mechanics it did not go to waste because it's useful a lot on a daily basis. And uh, this modern physics is really for highly specialized. I mean, no cell phone or computer or anything, a GPS system or anything else can work without modern physics. So modern physics is the one that led to all of this explosion of technology, whether from quantum mechanics or relativity. So that's true. We would have been still probably struggling with trying to build fire at home to warm ourselves or do stuff in here and maybe we don't have cars or we don't have all of the sophistication and everything else that we have in modern day electronics so without those two however these two are really 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 they're in opposites of one another 
So th remember this story of how wonderful it is, and it is. How precise it is, and it is. But there is another side to, uh, to the whole thing that is completely on the other side, and it's not the yin-yang again. This is completely opposite to that. This is like two warring passions trying to kill one another, but they're battling each other in different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of domains. One of them is on this side, fighting an enemy who is not in that place, and the other one is in another side fighting an enemy who is not on the same field. So that's basically what the whole thing is. So I'm going to stop recording. Where is the recording button in here? And I will see you guys next week.